say, I'll turn that on, eh? There you go. Now you can hear me. And everybody else listening will be able to hear online. Let's have a look at the background in Crete. As I mentioned, Crete is an island south of Greece. It acted as a halfway point for traders who were trading around the various ports of the Mediterranean Sea. And as many trading posts have been all over the world, they often have short-term visitors, they have money, they have no wife and kids with them, and that often leads to a very unhealthy social environment. And whether or not this contributed to Crete's culture, I can't say for sure, but they were known, or shall I say they were not known, for being morally upright. Crete had a reputation, and not a good one. Paul quotes one of their own poets, Epimenides, in Titus 1.12, where he writes, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And Paul confirms that this is true. This is the reputation of the people of Crete. But Paul says this is not just true of the Cretans in general, but many in their churches. Their culture was debauched and corrupt, and it had infested the churches there. The church also had many Judaizers. They were usually the first people to respond to the gospel when the gospel went around, but many of them held on to their teachings that you must keep the law of Moses to be saved. Now Titus was reasonably familiar with these false teachings because he had been with Paul when he went to the council of Jerusalem to sort out this problem uh, with the other apostles. In Galatians 2, chapter 1 to 5, it tells us you know, that he went with Paul to the council of Jerusalem. We also find that Titus was not a Jew, but was a Greek. But Titus had been a faithful ministry partner of Paul in various places that he went. But here, Paul leaves them in Crete to set some things in order. Because of the Cretan culture in general and the false teachers, the church was a mess. Titus is left there by Paul to clean it up. Imagine getting that job. Leading the church would not be easy at the best of times, but Paul has left Titus there to set some things in order. And praise God for that. The church needs good, sound men of leadership. Titus is left with the task of establishing elders within the churches, good leadership, to teach the people how they ought to conduct themselves. He starts with the, the leadership. Oftentimes, if you have rotten and bad leadership, it is very hard to change the culture of an organisation. You know that even within businesses, workplaces, governments, social clubs that you're a part of. If the leadership is rotten, then it's very hard to change the culture within. So Paul gives instructions on the standards that are needed for this new leadership. And this is very different to the accepted norms in Crete, but very necessary to lead an orderly and godly church. So we're going to read through Titus chapter 1, 5 to 9. This passage is similar to 1 in Timothy which forms the basis of our understanding on the qualifications for elders. But this is not an exhaustive list. Chapter 1, verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, 
not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. So he's not to be a rebel. He's not to be quick-tempered. I've met many a folk in my day who have been quick-tempered. And you'll be having a cordial conversation and all of a sudden they snap. Quick-tempered. Not pugnacious. There's a word we use every day, isn't it? Pugnacious. Which means aggressive or argumentative. Quick to fight. Not fond of sordid gain. Well, that rules out most of the televangelists selling their holy water and oils and ointments to fuel their private jets and mansions. In fact, if you're a pastor in, in America, it can be very lucrative to get into ministry. They're very generous over there with their giving. And there are many people who have gone into ministry because it, it makes for a very good wage. But the leader of a church is not to be motivated by money to go in for those reasons. It's interesting here, he, in the NASB it says that his children are to be believing children. The King James says faithful. Uh, this has uh, been a contentious point in some places. Uh, most places that this particular word, pestos, is translated does mean faithful. Uh, and some object to it saying believing children because a father can't force his children to believe. Salvation is a personal thing between you and God. A father or a parent can't force his children to be saved. Uh, and so to say that an elder is disqualified if one of his children are not saved does seem out of sorts, but they are to be faithful, and that means to be under control. And the reason here is because Paul is getting at, I guess in a sense, management skills. He wants the, the leaders, the, the elders, to be good managers of the church. And the proving ground for being good managers of the church is to be able to conduct your household well. And if your children are riotous and out of control because you refuse to discipline them, then what's the church going to be like? If that's the approach you take, where no discipline happens and people just run riot. That's the point that, that Paul is trying to make. And we see this clarification in Timothy chapter 3, verse 4. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his household, how will he take care of the church of God? So we see that clarification there. So that the eldership needs discipline and self-controlled men. And yes, he does need to be a man, as Paul says. We see in Paul's second qualification in verse 6 there, he says, he, 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 he must be the husband of one wife. Now, there's a few different ways to look at this verse, the husband of one wife. You could look at it that he must be married. Some would see it as that, that he must be a married man. Some would say that that's perhaps not the point he's making, that secondly, perhaps he's not to be a polygamous man, and therefore he's to have one wife and not three or four, because polygamy was not uncommon back in that day. And the way things are going may not be uncommon in our day, coming soon. Things are going a bit crazy. Thirdly, some would say that he's not to be a divorced and remarried man, 
depending on the reasons for that divorce. But lastly, and I think most would agree, that he has to be a he, though of course this is very unpopular these days. Paul does seem to make that very clear. He is not to be self-willed. He is to be loving and hospitable. Paul gives many reasons for these qualifications. We went through some. He needs to be able to look after the church and order it correctly. He needs to be able to manage it. But he must be able to stand against ungodliness and refute false teachers and that's not necessarily a job that any old person can do Paul is very concerned with the health of the church and its purity because the church is God's nucleus it's the nucleus of his work here on earth he's doing his work through his people the church and so there's a lot writing on it being a place of truth and of love. Let's read the remaining of chapter 1 from verse 10. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. <coughs> so after setting the standard for the, the elders, and some of those qualifications doesn't mean that only the elders are to have those qualifications. Many of those are, are his standard for Christians in general. But the elders, of course, must be uh, not necessarily better, but then not to have accusation against them. They are to be without reproach. But after Paul deals with the leadership, he moves on to the church member or the individual in dealing with the home life. We see that in chapter 2. He gives instruction about how the family should look and operate. Again, this is very different to Cretan, Cretan norms, but should be very normal for those making profession of faith in Jesus. Now, these were first-generation Christians. And often with first-generation Christians, there is a bit of putting off, putting on. There's... there's a big hurdle to get over in terms of habits and lifestyles that you've lived. Children who are brought up in second generation, third generation homes have an advantage in that sense. But if you've come directly out of the world, uh, it's, a, it's a big leap forward. And so these people have, have come out of this culture, this rotten culture, and they've become Christians. But as you well know, if many of your family and friends are still of that rotten culture, bad company corrupts good character. And those you hang out with can very much influence your views. Let's read from chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, speak these the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behaviour, not malicious gossips or enslaved to much wine, 
teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds, with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in every respect. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Okay, that was the whole of chapter 2. We're actually going to make it through pretty much the whole of Titus. It is only a small, a short epistle. But Paul points out here that they are to be examples to the community by how they behave. And in a sense, this is the foundation to their evangelistic outreach. The Cretan culture wasn't going to heed their message if, if the church was going to act just like the Cretes. They were not going to heed the good news of the gospel, of transformation, of power to overcome sin, if they lived just like the Cretes lived. And so they were to demonstrate their faith and their doctrine by their actions. And I'm sure you all know that the old saying, uh, preach the gospel at all times, when necessary, use words. You've all heard that before? This is falsely attributed to Francis of Assisi. Assisi. But there is a grain of truth in it. Our preaching of the gospel should never be to the exclusion of us living in a manner worthy of that gospel message that we preach. And that's not to say that our actions actually preach the gospel, but they lay down the groundwork. They roll out the red carpet. They call out in the marketplace, hear ye, hear ye. They, they provide that foundation to then preach the gospel. But it's your actual words that preach the gospel. As Paul said, how will they hear without a preacher? It, it may happen, but it's probably unlikely that someone is going to run up to you at work and say, what is it about you that makes you smile so much? That, that's the modern mantra of Christianity, that you just have to love so much that they see it in your eyes. The grain of truth is that, yes, we are to love and do good works. That's the groundwork so that we can preach the gospel with words. With words. Because if, if, if people, let's say workmates, if they know you to be a kind and generous an honest person, they are far more likely to stick around and listen to you when you tell them about sin, righteousness, and judgment than if you're an annoying, drunk slanderer. Like, it's, it's not, not rocket science. 
and this seems to be part of the point that Paul is making here, is that not only are they to act righteously because they're Christians, but it's building a foundation to reach the people around them. That, that, that quote that is attributed to Francis of Assisi, which doesn't appear to be his at all, uh, because it's not quoted by him in any writings nearby. He was an interesting man, because people the only thing most people know about this, this fella, other than the Pope took his name, uh, the modern Pope, but is this quote. This is the only quote that people know about this man, and yet uh, the Francis of Assisi was a man who went out and preached multiple times a day and he would stand on hay bales and on steps and, and preach out loud. And so to attribute such a saying to, to him doesn't fit if you know anything about Francis. In the third chapter, Paul instructs them to follow the rule of law, to be obedient to governing authorities they're not to be rebels or insurrectionists, which is interesting if you look at the history of Crete in the latter days, because many of the, the Christians did lead up uprisings. Perhaps they should have read, read the epistle to Titus. But Paul instructs them to be model citizens, to be respectable and blameless. That's not to say that they're to act all pious and out of pride and arrogance. Because he says, they used to be just the same. They used to be just like the Cretan in one way or another. But now they're not. Now they are called to excel in good work so they might stand out from the crowd and be good examples of what God can accomplish through his grace. We're going to read Titus chapter 3, and then we'll look at it in general. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Saviour and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things I want you to speak confidently, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good, and profitable for men. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factious man after the first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. Paul has some harsh words. There's one thing that struck me as I've looked a little bit through church history. I've just jumped ahead. There's, as I was studying through the, the epistle, the, the Cretan culture was a train wreck. Their own poets knew it. You look through Wikipedia, they'll tell you that it was a train wreck. But it's interesting because it provided 
a good background for the gospel to shine brightly. Their rotten and sinful behaviour was a background that made the gospel shine brightly. And this has often been the case throughout history, where the gospel is usually received among the darkest of places and in the most troublesome times. Whereas when Christianity was made a state religion um, by Augustine, the church in some sense suffered because it became complacent. There was no threat. Everybody could relax and just take it easy. And this is what I see in our time. We, we've had a century of acceptance of Christianity in the West. But that's very quickly fading. And now we live in a similar culture to Crete of that day. Australia, many Australians, I say this as a Kiwi, many Australians pride, pride themselves on going out on weekends and getting plastered, getting drunk. They have the lazy attitude, ah, she'll be right, mate. She'll be right. They, they love faking sickies, you know, taking the day off work to go fishing. Um, it's usually the case when uh, the postman doesn't come to work to pick up the parcels, someone else that comes because they've taken the day off to go fishing. Uh, you know, Australians love their foul jokes and sexual promiscuity. That, that's the culture that we live in. And so by all intents and purposes, the culture that we is now pervading Australia is very similar to that of Crete. And so these instructions to Titus, I believe, are very relevant to us in this day and age and the generation that we live in. Because this current generation, the younger ones, and the ones that are coming up after them, they have little to no understanding of Christianity, like none. And so we are in for some dark days going ahead. We already see it in politics. But the positive side is, is that the gospel will shine brightly because of that background. There are scores of people, some may call them silent Australians, but they're fed up with things like the gender-bending theories and, and all that kind of stuff as well. They just don't want to talk about it because they're scared about it. But as the culture deteriorates and things get worse, they will be looking for answers. They will be looking for hope. And I believe they will be open to the gospel, more so than people are now, because things are uh, complacent to an extent. And so these instructions to Titus are for our homes and churches and communities. And it's needed just today as back then. And so we are to be those shining lights of grace to God in this generation. We are to excel in good works, as Paul says. We're not to bring rebellion and revolution but we're to bring revival in as much as we can bring revival. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. And that's not escapism. That's not, we don't run out into the bush and hide and escape from, from the world, as tempting as that sounds sometimes. But we are to contribute to society without becoming like it. And if you think about that slogan, that's another slogan that most people know, in the world, not of the world. You could come away with the idea that, that we're unfortunately in this world, oh, horrible, but our goal is to not become like it. That's, that's the aim, is to not become like the world. And so the response of many, and when Christianity became a state religion, that's when all the monasteries started coming up. People became ascetics. They escaped from the world. That was their form of, I don't know what it was, purifying themselves. But they ran away. 
They didn't want to become of the world, so they left and went out bush. Or you can hide in your home and avoid people. And I get it because, you know, the world is an ugly place. We all know that. But this slogan, which is not in the Bible, if interpreted that way, that that's our goal, is to not be like the world, has the wrong focus. Because in Jesus' prayer, in John 17, he says, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Notice the goal isn't not to be of the world. That's the starting point. As soon as you become a Christian, you are not of the world. But you are left in the world. And so the goal is not to escape the world, but the goal is to go into the world with the gospel, to be an influence upon the world. Jesus desires that we are kept from the evil one and that we would be sanctified in truth but the direction or the goal is to be sent into the world. That's where he's sending us. So that the world may know that you sent me, he says. So we are not of the world, but we have been sent into it with a mission. We are to be functional and useful members of society to the extent that we don't compromise godly morals and truth and Christianity has had this role throughout history it's dealt with every culture and government you could possibly imagine and the goal has always been to be that light to be that voice of the gospel in saving people that is our mission as ambassadors of Christ rather than be influenced by the culture and the people around us, we are to influence them with the good news of the gospel. We are to reach out, not run away. When Stalin's communism was wrecking havoc during the first half of the 20th century, people like Richard Wormbrand didn't start a counter-revolution. But he and others like him lived out their Christianity with extreme courage, faith, and good works. And because of that, there were many stories of even communist soldiers who came to faith because they would torture the Christians in the most horrendous ways. And it's, it's hard even just to read it, let alone endure it. But ways that would have killed the average person three times over. And yet the Christian would bless and pray for the soldiers. And so that, that says something about the grace and the transforming power of God. Not to be a revolutionary, but to stand up for truth, to stand up for Christ, to be a testimony of his grace to the world. When Eric Little was in the Japanese Waishing internment camp during World War II, he didn't hate on the Japanese soldiers that were keeping them prisoners there. His actions and lifestyle was so selfless and humble and Christ-like that we still talk about him to this day. And even the, the, the descendants of those who were with him in the prison camp talking about him to this day because his character was so different to the others around him. It was outstanding. 
And unfortunately, this seems to be something that modern Christianity has lost. Much of the Western church has decided to look just like the world. And they want to look like the world so that they can attract the world. They don't want to be, you know, they want the church to be just like a nightclub so that people will feel comfortable coming in. And so they, they bring in dirt bikes to do jumps over the pulpit. Um, they take the, the church and they go and do church in the pub instead. You know, do all this in the name of relating to the sinner. But they seem to have it back to front because we're to be different to the world. We want to see them redeemed from the evil deeds that we, that we used to be part of as well. And don't get me wrong, I'm not, as I've said before, we're not to be separate to the world, but we're to be an example of the grace of God. Just like Jesus, he was, he was accused of things because he went and spent time with the sinners, with the gospel message. He didn't participate in their sinful deeds, but he was there with a purpose, to share the gospel. And by all means, we can go witness outside the pubs. But the goal is to rescue people from that lifestyle, not participate with them in it and validate it, if that makes sense. And so I said, as I've said, the problem we face and we find ourselves in is we've lived in a fairly peaceful time over the past so long. Comparative to times gone by. There have been very few threats. And so the church has become lazy, it's become self-consumed, and very ineffective. But that doesn't have to be the case. It shouldn't be the case. It's just sad that when there's no threat to personal safety, that, you know, non-Christians or people who feel religious or have some sort of religious experience, they, they feel comfortable going to church and being identified as a Christian because there's no skin on the, you know, there's, there's no downside to it. It's only when persecution comes. But because of that, all the worldly philosophies have entered into the church in Christendom as we know it. And this has led to the decline of the church in the West. And so now much of the Western church has no influence in our culture because it looks no different to the culture we live in. But as families and a local church, we have a responsibility to follow Paul's instructions here and to be godly role models to our family, our friends, co-workers, and to go over and above in helpfulness, in sensibility, in morality, manners, honesty. And this is why it pains me when I hear Christians using the same foul language that the, the world uses. Or they watch the same vulgar TV shows as the world watches. Because we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be an example to the world, not to lower ourselves to that same standard because, ah, oh, she'll be right, mate. You know, it's just language, it's just words. It is, and Paul gives instructions about that. So let's look, let's look at some of these, these things that he, he instructs. Men. Hands up if you're a man. Men, you are to be sober, temperate, not given to strong wine, not a drunkard. You're to be dignified or venerated for character, honourable. You're to be sensible, in other words, sound in mind, sane. Okay, that's what the word means, you're to be sane or you to be self-controlled. You're to be sound in faith, 
sound in love, sound in perseverance, steadfastness, constancy, endurance. Those are the characteristics that the men need to have. Ladies, put up your hands if you're a lady. You're to be reverent in your behavior. Or as the King James says, as becometh holiness, circumspect, which is the op opposite of irreverent or a mocker, disrespectful, reverent in behavior, not malicious gossips, not to slander people behind their backs. I have a good friend who's not a Christian. He is a Christian Christian mother-in-law. And the one thing I know about his mother-in-law, because it's the only thing he's told me, is that she's always bickering and gossiping with her church friends. Why would he want to become a Christian? How am I supposed to preach the gospel to him when that's his idea of a Christian, as a gossip and a slanderer? Not enslaved to much wine, just like the men, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, love their children. It's interesting that teaching what is good. In other words, don't encourage them to watch things like Desperate Housewives or to read The Woman's Weekly. You know, all those gossip magazines. You see, you see them going through the checkout, and they're vile. And it's, it's every new rumor under the sun. And yet people devour it for some reason. To love their children, to be sensible, of sound mind, sane. I'm glad Paul added this to the ladies' list as well. Sane, self-controlled. And that is one thing that this generation suffers, is the lack of self-control. It feels good, do it. That's the modern mantra. There's no self-control. Pure, which means to be chaste, modest. In fact, it even means to be immaculate. How's that? Workers at home, kind, be subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Young men, any young men here? Who wants to self-identify as a young man? <laughs> Be sensible. Of sound mind, Mark. Self-controlled. Showing yourself to be an example of good deeds. Purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach. So that the enemy or the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. That's, that's the outworking of having sound speech, is you won't have accusations about you from your workmates saying, oh, he's, I've seen him, I've seen what he talks about in the lunchroom, I know what he's like. Sound and speech. So then it's interesting, he goes on to servants or bond slaves urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters. Now, although servants and slaves were very different back then, it is not that dissimilar to employment, except ours is a voluntary employment, which makes these instructions all the more interesting, the fact he gives these instructions, and it wasn't voluntary in that sense. He still said to be subject to their own masters and everything well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith. Try preaching that at your next union meeting. It's very different to the workers' rights movement of these days. But as Christian workers, and as we are servants in a sense to our employers, we are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith.
And I realize this is all harder than it sounds. But this is what makes Christians stand out from the world. Because it's, it's hard to endure unruly managers and employers. But with God's grace and strength, all things are possible. And that's where, where to make this our goal, our standard, to be well-pleasing. So some examples for, for modern day life, working parents. You know, most working parents, you, you're working almost half of your conscious week. That's a lot of time in the workplace. That is a perfect opportunity for ministry to show forth good works, to excel in good works, or as Paul says, to be careful to engage in good deeds. Sound and speech. Because it's your, your workmates will see the way you act, the way you react in situations, and that's going to tell them a lot about the message you say you believe in. And that needs to be the foundation so that when you do have those opportunities to preach the gospel to them, the door will be half open already because they see you're not like the other workmates who are always talking about them behind their backs. For stay-at-home parents, amazing opportunity for good deeds to, to help widows, to help new parents, maybe new parents who are having twins soon, um, frozen meals for the sick. You know, there's always opportunity to excel in good deeds. For the retired, again, an amazing opportunity to engage in good deeds. They may not be the same good deeds as younger people, might not be climbing on top of a roof to fix things, whatever. But there's so much opportunity. I think of Loris helping Jeannie in her last days. You know, none of us knows the extent that Loris went to in helping Jeannie. But our good works are not just for unbelievers, although we are to excel in good works to everyone. Because Paul writes in Galatians, he says, So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those who are of the household of faith. So there are endless ways. We just have to look out for them. And it applies in every facet of life. As John Wesley put it, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. It's a good way to put it. And this is the one thing that struck me when I looked through church history, is the reputation that the Christians had in those first few generations, the reputation they had from unbelievers, people who were resistant to their movement, the one thing they were known for was their good works. They were known for being the most generous, selfless people they'd ever known. So although they disagreed with their message, they knew there was something different about them. And so while the rest of society lived for themselves, the Christians gave themselves to service. And that's where we get or got hospitals. It's where we got orphanages and rescue missions. In fact, even universities came out of the churches because that, that want to help, to educate, to advance other people, put them above ourselves. And as Paul noted, they turned the world upside down. Not through force, but through service and good works. They didn't live for themselves because they had died to themselves. In fact, there's 
plenty of stories when the plagues would go through various towns and cities that while the unbelievers would run for the hills to avoid getting the, the plagues, the Christians would go in and help. Even though they knew the risk of doing that. And many of them, you know, they, they died of the same sickness. But they were, they were selfless. And, you know, this, this goes against the modern mantra of put number one first, you know, put ourselves first. So it's, it's, it's amazing when you look back through history at what the genuine church or Christians did. I think of Jim Elliot, who risked his, risked, his, risked his life for a few natives. And it, it boggles my mind because, because I think, you know, is it really worth it? Like, Surely he could have achieved more if he was still alive. But as he wrote himself, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Oh, I think of Eric Little. The reason I mention him so many times is because I just read his biography. But he sent his, his wife and two children, and his wife was pregnant with the third, off to Canada. And he remained in a war zone and then was imprisoned in the internment camp and then died two or three years later of a brain tumour, never to meet his youngest daughter. And, you know, these, these stories rip my heart because I'm not sure if I could do the same. And it challenges me to examine myself. Are we dead to ourselves, or are we just like the culture? Are we too much like the world around us and that we look out for ourselves first? We, we need to remember that God's ways are not our ways. And that's what I think when I think of those stories where they didn't even get to see their children. In fact, Eric Little, he was born in China and then at six years old, he was sent to a boarding school for, it was a school that looked after missionary kids in London. And he saw his parents a few times into when he was, 20, I think, 23-ish, when he went back to China as a missionary himself. Like that, that boggles my mind that his parents are on the other side of the world as missionaries, and their kids are on the other side going to school. And I think to myself, you know, there's self-denial. There's sacrifice for the, for the sake of the, the message of the gospel. And it, it, you know, it's, it's easy to justify that, you know, oh, I love my kids, I, I could never leave them like that. But that's not necessarily a godly justification. Sometimes it's a, an idolization of our kids more than the purpose of God. And from the biographies I do read of missionaries who leave their kids behind and go into the mission field, the children, in most cases, seem to grow up with a greater love for God than others. And it always, it always makes me wonder why. Like, they've been abandoned, as, like, as we put it. And yet, they grow up with such a love for, for God's people. Usually, they, they often become missionaries themselves because they, they see the sacrifice. Right, let me wrap up. God's kingdom operates in a very different way than we do things. It's an upside-down kingdom. The poor are rich. The weak are strong and the greatest among us are servants. As we live among Christians, we are to be careful to engage in good deeds. As we wait for our blessed hope and the appearing of Jesus, our Lord, 
God and Saviour. We deny ungodliness and live righteously in the present age. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Father, give us the, the strength to heed this instruction. Lord, as we live among a sinful world, just like the people of Crete, Lord, help us to be different, to excel in good works, to go into the world, Lord, with the purpose for which you've called us, to reach those who do not know you with the gospel. Father, bring into mind things where we can excel in good works, where we can help others. Lord, not for our own glory, but for yours and for your gospel. Lord, bless us through this week. Open opportunities and doors for us to serve you. In Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to pull some tables out. Have some food. Teas and coffees are up there if you'd like to help yourself. Don't forget there's an offering box at the door. If you'd like